The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 9921 in the name of Gillian Martin on encouraging cyber resilience among young people. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Gillian Martin to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I want to start this debate off by saying thanks to an anonymous young woman. After weeks of flattery, cajoling and wearing down of resistance, she sent a semi-nude photograph of herself over Snapchat to a much older boy. Within half an hour or so, that photo was saved on the phones of multitudes of people in the area. She could see it being screen grabbed, she could see it being shared, and of course, she panicked. I want to thank her because she was brave and she did the best thing she could possibly do. She told her mother and together they went to the police to report the incident. And then they went to the press to raise awareness for other families. And that girl was just 11 years old. We all know stories of online bullying and shaming. We've seen it, we've maybe had children who've experienced it, we've maybe consoled a friend who's been through it. But over the past few years, it's taken on a new dimension that's becoming normalized. I've been quoted as saying that the practice of young people asking for nude photographs to be sent to them or sending unsolicited nude photographs themselves to others is endemic, and I do not use this word lightly. In talking to many young people about this for over two years now, I'm convinced we have an issue that could affect the mental well-being of many young people and influence how they form healthy relationships. And this is not just a behavioural issue that should be tackled solely in schools. Most of the image sharing happens out with school and the consequences of it make school difficult for the victims. Guidance teachers that I know tell of an issue which is resolved by home time, escalating overnight online and then coming back in through the school doors the next day increased in intensity and seriousness. PSE can and should raise these issues but it cannot operate in isolation. I was on the BBC this morning and my interview was trailed by the question, should schools do more to make teens cyber resilient? I think we should all do more. And looking to schools to take full responsibility is not just unfair, it's unrealistic and it just wouldn't work. Parents, I believe, are not as aware as they could be about what's happening. And they will be shocked to learn the practice has been thought of as no big deal amongst many young people. Certainly, I was completely in the dark about it, and I have worked with teenagers since mobile phones became everyday items, much less became mini computers with apps and cameras. I've spoken to hundreds of parents about this, some of whom I know are debating along with me today, and to coin a phrase, we don't know the half of it. Indeed, it was my friend and colleague, Christina McKelvey, who first raised the issue of revenge porn in this parliament, as a result of being made aware of it by her own teenager at the time and she got legislative action on it in the form of the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act. But the sharing of nude photos isn't just about young people exploring their sexuality, it can be about control. And don't fall into the trap of thinking it's just boys asking girls to share their bodies online with them. One of the most shocking conversations I had with a teenager told me of a girl who was one of the leaders of a friendship group who was holding nude photographs of her friends so that she could control them. If they didn't do what she wanted, she could deploy them to shame her so-called friends. And these photographs were a bullying tool. Talk about mean girls. So what can parents do? Well, maybe take a lesson from me on how not to react. My first reaction on hearing this kind of practice was a fairly primal one. I've got a 14-year-old daughter who won't thank me for mentioning her. And I'm not going to lie, I began to relate to the queens and kings of Grimm's fairy tales who built towers to keep their princesses in so they were adults. But to have an effective impact, parents have to tread a thin line between allowing their growing children the degree of privacy which recognises that they're developing as adults and being aware of what they could be subjected to online. And the best way, as with most, most things, is to talk and most importantly, give space to listen. It'll possibly be the most difficult conversation you have with your kids, but it will mean you can cancel the delivery of bricks for building the tower. And I don't believe further legislation is the way forward. We already have sufficient laws. But in talking to many young people, I'm convinced there's a lack of awareness that in soliciting naked photographs or sending unsolicited photographs to themselves, that they are breaking the law. 
It is, as we know, an offence to possess, send, make, take, distribute or show indecent photographs of children. That means the person taking the photo and the person who received it is breaking the law. If it gets forwarded on, that recipient is also breaking the law. And we know that these images can end up anywhere. Once it's off your phone and away, you have no control over where it ends up and it can be online forever. The impacts this practice could have on a young person's future is obvious. Our best result would be to empower our young people to refuse to be pushed into sharing images of themselves they would not be happy to be shared widely in the first place. And I would like us to get to a situation where young people feel empowered enough to call out others who prey on others to share or send unsolicited photographs. Not easy when you're a teenager. The most effective action will be that that comes from young people themselves. I was told repeatedly by a teen I know that they will not respond to adults standing in front of them telling them how to behave online. And that's why I am delighted that students from North East Scotland College Television Production Department who are in the gallery today and representatives from Young Scots DigiEye campaign have been working to produce two films written by, uh, by young people for other young people about sexting and nude image sharing. Members and their guests are going to be the first to see the two films. One's called Cyber Attraction, the other is Overexposure, at reception in Parliament tonight. And from tomorrow, they'll be on Young Scots' website to be viewed and shared by anyone. Teachers and parents can use them as a way to start that tricky but vital conversation. And I hope they'll be watched and shared by thousands of young people and spark conversations that empower them. I hope that these realistic, well-produced dramas, I had to say that, that's my own old college, <laughs> will get us all talking about consent, self-esteem and resilience. And to conclude, presiding officer, I'd like to tell a wee story. Ten years ago, when I was a college lecturer, I took 12 students who were mostly late teens on an exchange trip to Finland. And on our last night, we went to a nightclub. I sat my beer in the bar and I went up to dance. I was on the dance floor less than a minute when one of my male students ran after me with my beer and gave me a right talking to about never leaving my drink unattended. Why? Because his generation had it drummed into them they must always be vigilant in case their drink was spiked. In fact, they all laughed at me for being so naive. And I would like to think that with a concerted effort of us all talking about the dangers of sexting and image sharing, we'll get to a point where young people will be protecting themselves and their friends in the same way they do over spiked drinks. Putting yourself in a vulnerable, dangerous position by sexting will be so 2018. <laughs> and that change will be led by young people. Okay, uh, a wee note for everyone. Can I ask those in the gallery, please, not to either clap or catcall or shout, if you don't mind. Perhaps at the end you can show your appreciation to everyone that takes part in the debate. And can I ask those who are taking part in the debate uh, to be quite strict with their timing, because there's a lot of people who want to speak, and I don't want to leave anyone out, because time is limited. So speeches of absolutely no more than four minutes, please, and uh, Finlay Carson, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I must thank Gillian Martin for securing this important debate, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank my young helper, Callum Mackay, for putting together his first uh, speech for this debate and the research he's uh, uh, done on uh, underage gambling online. As a parent myself, uh, with two children growing up in the midst of the cyber revolution, this topic and our obligation to educate our children online is one of serious concern. But who should take responsibility? For social media companies to continually just shrug their shoulders is not good enough. The lack of action on developing safeguards fundamentally lies at the centre of many online problems. We must not and cannot sit in our hands waiting for action. Those companies turning a blind eye must realise that their lack of action is akin to allowing the exploitation of our children and young people. As we relentlessly accelerate into a digital world, the reach of social media influencers becomes more pronounced. Children are driven by peers and the desire to emulate their modern role models, increasingly exposing them to online danger. It is therefore also the duty of those influencers to set a precedent. And although this means holding to account for their actions, 
such as well-known YouTube star Logan Paul, who recently posted a video showing graphic imagery surrounding suicide victims to his 16 million followers, we must remember our duty as adults should be to react and dispute such actions without dropping to that level ourselves, as seen when many so-called responsible adults went on to send a series of death threats to Mr. Paul. Setting examples and ensuring internet companies do the right thing are important issues. However, perhaps the best way forward is through empowering our children on matters concerning their online behaviour. As well as creating legislation, we can bring about change by supporting charities such as the Rotary Peace Project, who facilitate and support school children through life skill based programmes which are student to student delivered. The goal of the organisation is to empower the next generation to develop their own ideas on the challenges the 21st century produces. 21st century challenges, including how to avoid making poor decisions online, making the right but often most difficult decision to, make, uh, to take. It is important to note that the internet has succeeded in giving youth a voice and therefore influence responsibility greater on many levels than any of our uh, past generations, responsibility that they did not previously hold within society. Young people have the ability to mould, learn and adapt themselves to stay on top of whatever uh, the, the evolution uh, nature of the online industry is, but they need our support. Other online dangers in question surround increasing prevalence and normalisation of gambling fundamentals through online gaming. This ubiquitous presence has consumed the entire industry, leaving children as young as 11 exposed to the pressure of ideologies, I, I, ideologies such as pay to win. For example, skin betting, whereby players bet with in-game items. The Gambling Commission reports 11% participation among 11 to 16 year olds, with the, high le the level as high as 20% of boys claiming to have done so. However, like everything, with great power comes great responsibility, and it's evident that many children lack the self-control needed to recognise and avoid the exploitative nature of modern online games and the potential disastrous consequences that that can follow. Until now, we have sat back and handed the responsibility of children to game developers, without society seeking a framework to prevent exploitation and potential for the normalisation of gambling-like activities. In many cases, online game developers continue to distance themselves from the debate on the basis that these concerns are out with their responsibility or jurisdiction. Avoidance to voluntarily reg regulate is tantamount to them denying their moral responsibilities. That their game, how, so, however, indirectly or directly may contribute to our worrying underage gambling rates. In order to safeguard our children, we must not only look to the online industry to make changes through voluntary or legislative action, our responsibility as politicians and parents also lie in empowering our young people, allowing them to make the best, right and most appropriate choices for themselves and their ever-increasing online activity. Can I just say at this point that um, if people take more than their time, it could penalise other people. And in fact, with the list I've got, stop people from speaking at all. <laughs> so uh, I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by thanking um, Gillian Martin for bringing this important topic to the Chamber and for all the work that, that she's doing on it. Doing on it. Um, I'm sure Gillian won't mind me saying that for people of our generation who grew up in a world very different to the world inhabited by our young folk today, the sheer scale of this topic can be quite overwhelming. Um, it affects every constituency in every part of Scotland, young people of both sexes and all sexual orientations and spans across several age groups from barely teenagers to young adults. It affects people of all classes, all backgrounds and whatever their other interests and aspirations are. And although the immediate impact is on our young folk themselves, it's, it's important that we recognise um, that it impacts on all of us. We've all got young people in our lives who we care about and want the best for. For current generations of young people where the divide between the real world and the online world is increasingly blurred, it's only to be expected, I guess, that aspects of their romantic lives take place in the digital world too. We're not going to be able to change that um, teenagers have always fallen in love with and wanted to have sex with one another and they'll continue to do so 
and in a healthy and respectful context. Fair play to them, it's part of growing up. Um, but while we can't and don't want to stop hormones raging and romance is blossoming, we really have to do all we can um, to raise young folks' awareness of the new dangers and risks that go along with all of this in a digital age. Um, we won't ever be able to protect our young people from unrequited love or a broken heart, but we can do our best to protect them from the mental anguish of seeing intimate images of themselves appear in public or from, for ending up with um, sexual offence charges on their record. Presiding officer, a big point of having an impact on that, I think, is about understanding how teenagers' brains work and the pressures that they're under. Recent research into the teenage brain has shown that there's a heightened risk-taking during adolescence. At the same time, the influence of peer pressure also peaks. Quite a combination, which I think can help us um, to understand why our young people um, behave in ways sometimes and take risks that most of us would find utterly terrifying and would never think of doing. The example that Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore gives, and I'd recommend her talk on the subject to anyone who's interested, is of an intelligent 13-year-old girl who knows all about the health risks of smoking. If she's out at the weekend and her friends offer her a cigarette, she's very likely to smoke it. This is because neuroscience shows us that the risk for a teenager of being ostracised their, from their peer group completely outweighs any of the other risks that they would think about in terms of, of the health risks of smoking. Viewing sexting and the sharing of intimate images in this context helps us to understand the pressures that our young people are dealing with. If it's seen as something everyone else is doing, if it's presented as a normal part of a relationship, as validating, the pressure must be immense for them. At the same time, the area of the brain associated with self-regulation and judgment is still developing and teenagers are so prone to taking risks. So for me, it feels like if we stand here emphasising career consequences, legal implications, bullying, mental health repercussions, um, that actually it's not going to be good enough. It's not going to do what we want it to do. In fact, I'm really quite sure of that. I see that time's ending and I don't want to, don't want to overrun. So I would just echo Gillian's sentiments about working with young people themselves, really listening to what they tell us will help keep them self, uh, safe, well and happy. Thank you. I call Mary Fee, followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I too begin by thanking Gillian Martin for bringing this debate to the Chamber today and allowing us to debate the very important issue of cyber resilience. Without doubt, the internet has been one of the greatest inventions in our history. It connects the world in many ways and offers many, many opportunities to all of our citizens and our communities. And the benefits of being online are far reaching. However, as with all things, there are many disadvantages. And despite the opportunities of the internet, there are risks that can affect almost everyone, especially young and vulnerable people. Children and young people today are connecting with each other in a wide range of ways that were not available to any other generation before. And as such, we need to encourage open conversations with young people about the dangers of the internet and of social media. And too many children and young people are being exposed to bullying and pressures online resulting in quite serious implications for mental health and for social stigma. And raising awareness of the career consequences and the legal implications are a positive step that should deter perpetrators from bullying and trolling online. And the damaging and shocking increase in sexual offences committed by young people shows we need a connected approach between government, schools, parents, charities, youth organisations and most importantly, social network companies to tackle the scourge of sharing private and intimate details between young people and so-called sexting. And the DigiEye campaign by Young Scott is a fine example of warning young people about the dangers of the internet and promoting safety and resilience in dealing with peers online. And the Equalities and Human Rights Committee recently produced the report, it's not cool to be cruel, prejudice-based prejudice bullying, and had, there's too many big words here, presiding officer, I'm very sorry, <laughs> prejudice-based bullying and harassment of children and young people in Scotland in July of last year. 
And during the evidence sessions, we heard from young people and youth organisations that more and more young people, especially girls, are subjected to sexual harassment online. And I would encourage everyone in the chamber and everyone who listens to this debate to read that report. And I can guarantee you will be shocked to hear the wide ranging harassment young people are facing online, not just in our schools. And, presiding officer, we need to be far more proactive as a society to encourage young people to become more cyber resilient and to encourage them to have open conversations when they have been subjected to cyber bullying or harassment. So we all have a role to play in ensuring our young people are safe and can enjoy the benefits, the real benefits that the internet can bring, whilst at the same time ensuring their safety. And debates like this one tonight are an important step in raising awareness. And can I close by once again thanking Gillian Martin for bringing this debate to the Chamber tonight. Thank you. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague Gillian Martin for bringing this important debate to the Chamber on this, as I understand it, Safer Internet Day 2018. Um, as my colleague Ruth McGuire made the point, this is a, a huge issue and I would note the contributions we've had um, so far, which are very much focused on the dangers of image sharing. Um, so I, I intend to focus my remarks on some of the broader issues I would um, suggest are pertinent to cyber resilience. But before doing so, I would just like to um, echo the point that I think in terms of actually empower, the key is empowering young people and it's working with young people. And that can start at home. I, I almost think that in terms of teaching the responsible use of the internet should be as much a role of a, of a parent or a caregiver as, for example, advising a child of the dangers of road traffic or the railways or the dangers of water, of electricity. The things that I recall from my childhood is just the basic skills that you learn about how to stay safe in the world. And we have to adapt for the world, world that we're in now, where the internet is so pervasive and is only going to become more so. And I would say that a balanced approach is required because just as when we're bringing up kids, we can't insulate them and wrap them in cotton wool and isolate them from the world. We can't put them in a towel as much as I'm sure every parent wants to. We Equally, um, equally with the internet, we can't cut children off from the internet, we can't cut them off from the use because it's such a, a vital skill and it's such a necessary skill for the jobs of the future. It's important that this generation of digitally native people are allowed to develop these skills, skills naturally. So I think the balanced approach is correct. And I would just note some of the excellent resources that are out there. The UK Safer Internet Centre Education Pack for Parents and Carers, the Young Scots DigiI, and of course, what Police Scotland provide as well. Um, what I would like to just focus on though, some of the broader issues um, with cyber resilience, because one of the things that very much strikes me now in any sort of aspect of life, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in family, we're often sitting with these devices next to us, our mobile phones, and we check them and we recheck them. And we're constantly looking to see what's happening on Twitter, what's happening on Facebook, what's happening in other social media platforms. And we live a very distracted life and it impacts upon our relationship with other people. It impacts upon our capacity to sleep. Do we really need our phone at our bedside? Now, I remember as a kid growing up, my mother refused to allow me to have a games console until I was 11 years old. And I remember I begged and begged and begged for Christmas that I could get one because she was convinced that actually this sitting in front of the TV would not be a good idea at all and I should be out playing. Now, I do not know what she would think if, you know, if I was growing up at five, six years old and I could have a handheld phone with you know, 10 times the power of a PlayStation it was then and I access to this abundance of information. So there's also so the question about how we relate all of us, both children, young people and adults, to the internet and information it provides. And so cyber resilience skills are also about, for example, being able to identify fake news, misinformation, scams and these skills are incredibly important as well and I think all fundamentally that comes down to a sort of skill of you know critical thinking it's incredibly important at that when we think about cyber resilience that's incorporated as well but the time it's remaining President officer I would just say we also have to be looking to the future as a excellent reading from Bernardo's highlights there are opportunities and risks 
But as we move forward, the internet is going to become more and more a part of our life. The internet of things, um, it, um, augmented and virtual reality as well. And it will be for the children of today and will be in the future working alongside robots and artificial intelligences in the workplace. And indeed, our bodies may indeed be cognitively enhanced with machines and computers. So I think while well, we look at this coming revolution of te um, technology in the, 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 these future decades, it's important to remember that our, our, our brains aren't changing. We're still subject to the same risks and dangers that we always have been. So I think it's just important with cyber resilience we have that much broader concept as well. And I, once again, I want to thank Gillian Martin for bringing this motion to the Chamber. Call Tavish Scott, to be followed by Ash Denham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Gillian Martin's thought-provoking and indeed challenging remarks this evening uh, brought three points to me. Uh, first, on mental health. Secondly, on relationships. And thirdly, and maybe above all, on resilience of young people. Uh, because for many of us uh, today who uh, did, I know it seems a long time ago now, go through uh, childhood ourselves, uh, the resilience to deal with what was going on in the classroom or in uh, a wider social setting uh, was easier uh, because these things called mobile phones didn't exist. There's no two ways about it. We all had our challenges, but they are but nothing compared to the challenge my kids go through around school or around post-school life now uh, with what it is. And Finlay Carson was right about uh, the power of major corporates who are, have uh, a, a very, very... Uh, major role to play in how our young people grow up today. Uh, are we doing enough about it? I am not so sure that we hold those people to the fire in the way in which we could. But Julie Martin's right about uh, resilience. She's right about the importance of measures uh, we can take uh, to address that. Part of, part of that challenge is for people of a certain generation, uh, keeping up to date with the technology, understanding it. Uh, and I suspect that much of the work that does need to be carried out is as much about uh, helping parents uh, as it is in the many sensible contributions that have been made across the chamber today about helping young people in schools uh, at home and in other uh, youth club environments. Uh, because for parents, this is without doubt pretty scary stuff. Uh, I want to highlight uh, just three measures uh, tonight, three initiatives that have taken place in uh, Shetland, because I think this is as much a debate about what can be done as, as to analyse the problem which others, uh, again, across the Chamber have done very uh, sensibly this evening. Uh, the Ch Shetland Child Protection Committee have done uh, a huge amount of detailed work in this area over the last uh, number of uh, years, uh, and just in the past number of months, uh, virtually safe, virtually sound youth conferences have been held across many schools uh, in Shetland. The important point here is it is young people who've designed the courses, young people who have talked to each other, young people who've looked at what is available and how best to uh, take that knowledge and to take uh, those topics into workshops so that uh, their peers can learn. Not people my age, not people uh, wearing uniforms or people who come from uh, different agencies, but young people themselves uh, taking the initiative there. And that is, uh, I think, at the heart of why those youth conferences have been so successful. Uh, most uh, S1 pupils across the islands have attended now a child exploitation and online protection uh, safety workshop. Again, uh, secondary six pupils, secondary six young people have been trained in delivering those internet safety sessions in schools and new materials supported by some of the initiatives that take place across uh, Scotland have been made available to keep that training up to date and specific to real life uh, situations. And finally, um, school parent councils, again in many years of Shetland, have arranged for internet awareness sessions uh, aimed not, yet, not just, uh, as I say, at children, but also at parents uh, as well. And as Karen Fraser, the vice chair of our peer, uh, mobile phone and internet safety committee, that's a subcommittee of, of the CPC in Shetland, said uh, the other week, the workshop is about staying safe online and it focuses on bullying and the effects it has on everyone, victims, the bullies and the bystanders. It raises awareness about the risks associated with internet use and explores with participants issues that affect them. Uh, one final thought. There is a really uh, important book that uh, the local library in Lerwick are using, the Shetland Library are using, called Chicken Clicking. It's actually aimed at three and four year olds, but it is a dark, dark story, a scary story indeed, about uh, online um, 
troubles. And uh, I, I thought the point about this book is that while it's written and aimed at three and four year olds, it can be read by um, young people of a much older age than, uh, than preschool three or fours. Uh, and that, uh, to me, is the effect of looking uh, innovatively at how solutions can be found to help young people in these most trying of times. I got distracted there and let you go way over time. <laughs> I call Ash Denham to be followed by Brian Riddle. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start my speech by paying tribute to Gillian Martin for securing uh, debating time for this, what is a very important issue. And as a mother of young teens myself, this issue is something that I've given quite a bit of thought to recently. Um, and as has been mentioned already, children today are clearly growing up in a very different environment to the one that my generation did. And I can't be the only person in this chamber who is very glad that Facebook didn't exist when they were 17, as I am. Um, when I tell my children that I didn't even get a mobile phone until I was in my 20s, they just sort of stare at me and they don't really know what to say. I don't think they can quite comprehend that idea of a, a pre-mobile, a pre-internet world, that idea that you don't have a whole computer or access to the internet just in your pocket. Um, but our lives are now partly lived online with all the benefits, all the challenges and all the dangers that that brings for both children and for adults alike. But it's obviously children that are most at risk from the potential dangers. And it's young teens that are thought to be the most at risk from activities. And I'll, I'll focus specifically on um, one that's known as sexting. So Kate Burles, she's an education team coordinator. Um, and that's a part, it's called SEOP, which is a command of the National Crime Agency. And she said that working with young people, they were finding that sexting increasingly feels like the norm in terms of behavior in their peer group although I'm not sure that teenagers would actually recognize this term that we use of sexting. Um, I think they probably call it something like nude selfies or dodgy pics. Um, but that normality of this um, sort of practice is certainly the impression that I received. I visited a local high school quite recently and I had a bit of time and I spoke to a group of S5 girls and I brought up this subject to ask them what they thought was this was something that was happening. And they kind of just looked at me and they were like, yeah. And then they proceeded to give me loads of examples of where this had happened like last week and what happened to so-and-so and this had happened. It's very, very normal. Um, it varies, there's lots of different examples of it. One particular uh, thing is called snaking. And um, that's where a usually a boy befriends a girl um, and then asks for pictures or puts pressure on her to produce pictures. Then he distributes them to his friends and then even posts them online. And um, when you do speak to teenagers, they can all give you an example of where this had happened. So I think it's probably quite prevalent. It's probably more prevalent than we realize. And I think it, it is going on um, all around us. And these pictures can be around the school with quite horrible effects, literally within half an hour. Um, uh, obviously, with having quite devastating consequences for the, the teenagers concerned. Girls are reporting more instances of being pressured to obviously um, send these pictures and pressure is heaped on them with uh, what I remember has been quite familiar insults. So if you don't send the pictures, you're frigid, but if you do send the pictures, then you're easy. So there's no way to win in that scenario for girls, as usual. Um, but because it seems so normal, because it seems as if everybody is doing it, it can be hard to resist that pressure and easy not to think about the consequences. And as a parent, I have spoken to my teens about this in an attempt to show them that they can talk to me about these things and obviously to give them space and time to think about this situation before they might be, be faced with it. Um, we do need to educate children about the risks and offer them support if and when they might need it. One of my friends was a te is a teacher, she's still a teacher now, she's been a teacher for 20 years and based on some of the things she'd seen over the years on mobile phones, her advice to me when I got pregnant was never get your children a smartphone until they're at least in their 20s. I'm not sure that that is the solution that we're looking for, but I do understand the sentiment that behind that. I think teens talking to teens is clearly the way forward. And so I think the videos, uh, the short films that Gillian Martin has mentioned today that are being promoted by young Scott are certainly part of the solution. Thank you. Before I call Mr Whittle, uh, there's still a few uh, members who wish to speak in the debate. So. I will accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I would invite Gillian Martin to move a motion without Moves. notice. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? 
That is agreed. And I therefore call Brian Whittle to be followed by Rona Mackay. What an excellent decision. We all sitting comfortably. Nice. <laughs> uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and uh, can I refer, refer members to my register of interest in that I am a board member of the West of Scotland NSPCC. I would like to start by also adding my thanks to Gillian Martin for once again uh, securing time in this chamber to raise awareness of the dangers that being online can pose, especially among the younger communities. And I know that is something that she has continued to champion in this place. And without a doubt, the internet and the ease of uh, online access has so many benefits in learning, education and communication. And that is a fact I do not think we should gloss over. As a tool used properly, it can open up the universe and transport us to places limited only by our imagination. And I, recently, with my youngest, uh, as part of her school project, we have stood on the deck of the Titanic and we have visited, it, uh, visited that ship in its watery grave. We have come face to face with Titanoboa, a prehistoric snake estimated to be up to 50 feet long and weighing in at over a ton. As an educational tool, its potential is almost limitless. However, we are all too aware of the dangers that can lurk online from the vulnerable and the unaware. With online bullying through to much more sinister issues, it is clear we are struggling to stay ahead of the curve. Now, to, to, to help you out, Ash Denham, I remember getting my, my first mobile phone when I was 32 years old uh, and having just retired from athletics. Uh, my employer handed me the phone and I thought I'd absolutely made it. And it was akin to carrying a brick around with me. Now, now at that time, my eldest daughter was young and no, no need to even think about her uh, cyber, uh, cyber security. We're all on a few years and my middle daughter starts to get to grips with the internet, although again, no need to worry about social media. I now have a nine-year-old and she has uh, one of my old smartphones attached to her, mother, her mother's contract, which costs buttons. And she now has access to the internet, social media and her friends whenever she has her phone. Now it's great for me because I can FaceTime her at breakfast time and in the evenings. But there's always that lurking threat of online, uh, online abuse. Now, I now have uh, grandchildren uh, at the age of five and six who can do things with an iPad that baffle me. They'll be watching something on the iPad and all of a sudden with a swish of a finger, I've lost control of my television as their viewing preferences appear on the screen. And perhaps that's part of the issue here, uh, that technology is moving faster than some of us are learning. We're not keeping up. We're falling behind and therefore struggling to understand the safety issues that are, as online develops. To that end, may I commend uh, uh, the NSPCC programme Be Share Aware, where they offer advice on how to keep our children safe online. As they point out, we are fine talking to our children about crossing the road, bullying or talking to strangers, but we're less likely to discuss staying, stay, staying, stay, staying, stay, staying safe in the digital world, about social networks and apps and games our children are using. Now, perhaps, as, as, as I've mentioned, this is something to do with our own understanding of the digital world. And while we're on the subject, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just mention a slight bugbear of mine in that computer games come with an age recommendation on them for a reason. And I see too many youngsters playing computer games for 18 plus, and I think we all need to be a bit more aware. Online bullying is a pretty new problem, but one that I think most of us in this place are all too aware of. Make a comment or post a speech, or God forbid, make a mistake in this chamber, and it's like jackals around the wounded wildebeest, yet we accept that as a hazard of our job. And I wonder if we really should. Uh, and I wonder if we're kind of normalising that kind of behaviour. We, are, as supposed adults, will deal with that in the main, although I suspect that few will go unaffected in some way by that kind of ritual attack. If that is our children, though, the effects can be much more profound and longer lasting. That is abusive behaviour. And with Childline child reporting a 12% rise in cyberbullying counselling sessions, can I once again commend the NSPC for the work they do in schools, helping primary schools to recognise abuse in all its guises? Because, as I've said before in this chamber, many children who are being abused don't recognise they are being abused, especially online. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I finish by just reinforcing the point that our children's safety online is all of our responsibilities, as, as others have said in here. We need to be aware of what they are accessing and what their activity online is. And we need to be unpopular sometimes as the frontline internet police and say no to certain apps, games and social media. It can be as simple as an ongoing conversation, talking to our children. Now, wouldn't that be a breakthrough? Deputy Presiding Officer. 
I'll tell you what would be a breakthrough with people would listen and keep their speeches under four minutes you because half an hour. <laughs> people no people are likely to lose out on this and have their own contributions cut down. It's not fair to colleagues, and I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Gillian Martin for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today and for all the work she's done on this subject. As we've heard from speeches across the Chamber, young people today are under so much more pressure than my generation was growing up. My childhood was spent playing, going to school, watching TV or swimming. In my teens, I spent endless hours on the phone to my best friend, much to my mum and dad's frustration as she only lived next door. Of course, there were no mo mobile phones, internet, Facebook, Instagram or Snapchat, and life was simpler of that, I have no doubt. Our par parents told us not to talk to strangers, and that was the extent of the personal safety messages that we got. Home for most of us was a safe, secure place where what happened in the playground with friends stayed in the playground. Now young people are contactable 24 hours a day, and despite our best efforts, this is largely their world, their relationship with cyberspace and their own virtual reality. It's estimated that 69% of 12 to 15 year olds owns a smartphone, and at 16, that percentage jumps to 90%. This much access to photo and video sharing technology combined with hormones and curiosity has created the perfect storm for sexual imagery and cyberbullying. Studies have found that the majority of teenagers think that sexting is normal and harmless. This is shocking and scary. Without intervention and education, the teenagers who are storing and sharing this content begin to view others as sexual objects. Over time, psychologists have seen that these thoughts lead to a lack of empathy, an increase in anger and an increase in sexually aggressive crimes. Unfortunately, we're already seeing this, as Gillian mentioned in her motion. In four years, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service has seen cases of a child committing a sexual crime against another child rise by a troubling 34%. For the young people who send sexual images, our objective is not to shame them for their decisions. Our goal is to understand the driving motivation behind their behaviour. Because remember, we created the world that they are living in. Social scientists have found that many young people share explicit materials of themselves in the search for social validation and acceptance from their peers, as Ruth uh, McGuire outlined. However, receiving a negative response can have catastrophic consequences. Uh, the NHS has reported that cyberbullying increases the risk of suicide by 30%. So what can be done about this? First, we must accept that resilience doesn't mean simply telling children to avoid this behaviour, because that, that won't work. While children, parents and teachers need to be aware of the ramifications of these choices, we must remember that resilience is built by the way we respond to opposition and difficulty. We have a responsibility to provide young people with resources that teach them healthy ways to manage their sexuality and self-esteem. There are an num increasing number of resources that can help. We've heard about them today, the Young Scots Initiative DGI, um, the International Justice Mission do good work, the Scottish Government Cyber Resilience Programme, and they're all, they're all helpful um, to try and uh, stem this. On Internet Safety Day, I urge social media sites to take more responsibility by tightening up their security rules and practice. In my view, it's their moral responsibility to do so. Presiding officer, this is a difficult issue to resolve, but resolve it we must. It's impossible to predict exactly what will help every child in Scotland, but we must take action. Even taking action on behalf of, on behalf of the well-being of one child is worth taking. The children of Scotland deserve to have wonderful lives and by making sure they are cyber resilient, we can help them stay safe in this world that we, as adults, have created. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Johnson, followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too would like to thank Gillian Martin, not just for bringing forward this, what's undoubtedly a very important debate to the Chamber this evening, but also for reassuring me that I'm not the only one that would like to construct a very tall tower and I think the only thing I'd like to clarify is what age can we, we safely lock them up there? I mean, is, is five too young? Because certainly that is my instinct. But the reality is this, our, our, our children are growing up in a world where technology is just part of the world. It's not something different. It's not something other. It is part of their everyday existence and part of their futures too. Indeed, it, it was a, 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 something that was underlined to me when I watched my eldest daughter uh, when she was uh, just two uh, go up to our television screen and try to swipe it. And it just underlined for me how she perceived technology and how what she understood 
uh, she could expect from, from technology. It was just part of her experience. She expected to see a screen and be able to interact with it. And I think that's, a, in a sense, I think the perspective that we need to be looking at. And I think, in some ways, this debate is, is summed up a little bit in combination of what Ruth McGuire said and Gillian Martin. Teenagers are still teenagers, and teenagers are always going to do the things that, that teenagers will do. And actually, what they will do online is an extension of the sort of behaviours that we are all familiar with. But the other key thing is if we come thundering in as adults and going, see this new internet thing, I want you to turn it off and not use it, we're kind of not going to, to get it. So we need to understand that in treating the internet as something as alien and different, we're perhaps perpetuating the problem. You know, this is a debate which is about freedom and the, uh, extending freedom to our children as opposed to protection, which we, we must seek to do in balancing that. It's about providing children and young people with the skills and indeed the ambition to explore the world, while at the same time trying to instill the, the, the sort of habits and behaviours that will keep them safe um, and, and do things safely. But, and I recently took part in a, a debate which was hosted by the, uh, by the Edinburgh Mela, which involved young people exploring these issues. And what struck me was, was two things. First of all, how conversant they were with the broad range of issues around the internet, from cyberbullying, but up to sort of the, the things, uh, issues around freedom of speech and copyright and so on. And the, the way these young people could talk about those issues seamlessly, I think, underlines just how uh, sophisticated young people's views can be. But, but also how they don't see the divisions they do. But, uh, but the other key thing was listening to an academic who was pointing out that a lot of the issues that we deal with with the internet, internet are not new. They're the issues of media and of free speech, which have existed as long as the, the printing press has been around. And there was more, there's the moral panics that we've had around the ability to freely distribute pamphlets are, as much, uh, are very similar uh, to the, the moral panics we have around the internet. The difference is, is the scale the pervasiveness and the pace of change that technology uh, gives the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, 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 the trends and the behaviours that we see um, uh, uh, through uh, many of the issues that we've been discussing th this evening. So that is what we need to understand, is how we can contextualise our, our, our uh, very real concerns and the ways we've always handled teenagers, but making it relevant to the internet age. And I think, uh, you know, so I think it's about ensuring that our teenagers can talk openly, that we can, they have a space that they can uh, uh, talk to adults and indeed to each other about the issues that they're facing, that we also provide teenagers and young people with the skills that they need in order to navigate the world, but, but doing so um, with still that sense of, of freedom that they need to, in, 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 to engage the world. And the final point I'd just like to um, uh, draw attention to, is I thought it was also very interesting in the Bernardo's uh, briefing, was that we mustn't just only talk about the risk, we must also talk about the other issues around the internet, which is around inclusion. That we mustn't just assume that all young people are engaged in the internet and are innately aware of it. We must also be aware that some young people are excluded from social media and the internet as well. And we must look at all of these things in the round. And I'll stop there. Sorry, that's 20 seconds over. Sorry, presiding officer. Call Liam Kerr to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is <coughs> customary to congratulate the MSP who brings a debate. In this case, I just prefer to thank Gillian Martin. Because what worries me most about this debate is, as an average, reasonably tech-savvy parent in my early 40s, I realise now how little I know about young people's online experience. For example, there is a game called Roblox, or Roblox, or something like that. Uh, but it has more than 30 million users and you build a kind of Lego virtual world. Apparently, it is one of, if not the, most popular game played by children from five to 10 years of age in the UK. In context, according to a headmaster at a primary school in Coventry, who wrote to uh, a warning letter to parents recently, over half of their five to six-year-old pupils and over 70% of their six to seven-year-old pupils are playing this online game. The issue here, or one of them, is that there is a chat feature, which according to the app is the best place to imagine with friends. According to a primary head in Manchester, who also felt compelled to write to parents, there is no way to screen contacts or to disable the messaging. The Coventry study showed that most of the children surveyed had online friends in Roblox that their parents didn't know about. 
and had received many in-game messages from strangers. Many of the children said their accounts were maxed out, meaning they have 200 online friends. The study reported that a lot of the messages were inappropriate and echoes one Sunderland mother's report that her daughter had received a message asking, hello Cupcake, do you want to meet up? Her daughter is eight. In all cases, the children reported not telling their parents of the inappropriate messages. And to pick up a point uh, raised by Brian Whittle earlier on, it claims to be a kid's safe site, which is supposed to monitor use by those under 12. But the head was able to set up an account, register as a three-year-old, and then play 18 certificate games, including Grand Theft Auto, Call of Duty, and Halo. Uh, since I'm on the subject, speaking from anecdotes I've heard, I do think we need more research into the impact of playing games with inappropriate language and violence on underage children's health and well-being and the effects on their attainment at school. Uh, finally, in terms of awareness, Finn Carson brought up online gambling. I note the recent Gambling Commission reports that suggest there are now 370,000 children between 11 and 16 participating in gambling-related activities in just one week, and up to 31,000 underage classified problem gamblers, underage children who are classified as problem gamblers, with many more classified as at risk. This is terrifying but it's perhaps not surprising. Apparently the game Candy Crush uses a gameplay loop psychology, whereby a repeating chain of events is used in order to establish an addiction-like attraction to the game through the regular release of a neurochemical reward in the brain. Uh, and you do this by the game presenting the right play-to-win ratio. People, by which I mean children in this context, are consequently susceptible to proposed purchases in order to continue the reward cycle and advance at the same rate through the game. Now, I understand that none of these principles are regulated and permit the potential exploitation of an age group possibly susceptible to suggestion and manipulation. So, congratulations to Gillian Martin for securing this debate, but thank you also, uh, because anything which raises awareness both amongst young people and those of us who are not so young, as this debate has, must be a good thing. Uh, and I wish the campaigns you reference every success going forward. Thank you. Call Emma Harper to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague Gillian Martin as well for bringing this important issue to Chamber today on Safer Internet Day. And uh, I'm going to focus my words on a conversation with my nephews and two other programmes out there that have been used to help in addition to the DGI that has been mentioned. So I'll probably shuffle a bit of my papers around here. Um, we've heard members talk about issues around digital devices, mobile phones, computers, tablets, issues with texting, sexting, post sharing negative, harmful writings, things like that. The digital era is upon us and we must empower our children to be smart and responsible users of the technology while avoiding risk and harmful online activities. So when I was having a conversation with my two young nephews for comments on what they thought cyber resilience meant, um, I had a wee answer from them. One's 13 and the other one's 15. Be safe online, they said. We get taught that in school. Okay, I said, what does that mean? Well, my mum tells us not to accept friends we didn't can face to face. And didn't ask for lasses to send naked pictures. That's not on. So I said, what if the lassie sends it to her boyfriend and he promises not to share it with his pals? I write, the boys laughed. Should Ken better? Once it's out there, it's out there forever. OK, I said, what about you lads? Should young people like your mates or people your age post photos of themselves drinking bucky or smoking cigarettes? Why is that not recommended, I said to them. What are the risks? Well, they shrugged their shoulders, so we discussed it and we talked about the possibility of job interviews in the future. And I asked, are you likely to get a job interview if you have photos on your profile that shows pictures of you up to naked? Well, the boys hadn't thought of this, but they said they would talk about it with their pals when they went back to school. Because we've we focused as well on peer support and the fact that if we can get the kids to engage with the kids, that's part of helping address this issue. I also found an online resource, so it's separate to the DGI, 
This one is, um, was built in Singapore. It's a digital intelligence educational initiative and research framework, but they call it DQ World. And they educated or engaged with kids between eight and 12 years old. So that's actually really a lot younger than the 11 to 26 years old. But they did a pilot study that showed the impact of raising awareness of the children's um, development across several areas that are focused on the online uh, cyber resilience requirements. And there's another programme that I heard about, just to close, presiding officer, um, that it says, um, yesterday while I was visiting Maxwellton High School in Dumfries, I learned about an anti-bullying programme in Finland, which Gillian um, Martin mentioned Finland earlier. This anti-bullying programme in Finland is called Kiva, and there's no translation for it, but it's an anti-bullying um, programme with an online focus as part of it as well. And it works in Finland and it's been tested at Max High using pupil equity funding to support it. So that's actually something that they are looking at, they are sharing, they're going to measure the outcomes from that so that we can engage our kids in what the best action would be or activity online. So Gillian's motion notes the view that increased awareness of career consequences, legal implications and bullying and mental health repercussions of such behaviour should be encouraged. We need to make sure that our kids are equipped to deal with the internet and the online challenges that they will face as they grow up. So thank you, presiding officer. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Gillian Martin for raising this issue here in the Chamber. It's not uncommon for a generation to face issues that parents and teachers of the previous generation might struggle to prepare them for. Growing up with the internet, many young people today are familiar with its uses and possibilities from social media, job hunting, handling bills, or just finding information. With a few clicks, you can do everything from turn your heating on at home to watch a cat play the piano to connect with someone on the other side of the world. But being familiar with the internet does not mean that young people have the digital skills that they need. When you grow up with something being so normalized, it's easy to be unaware of the dangers. And when it is a relatively new technology that your parents or teachers may be unfamiliar with, it too often results in a trial and error approach, which doesn't work. This can be a particularly hard issue for us to debate without sounding hopelessly out of touch to any young person listening. I'm conscious myself that I sound like someone I might have stopped listening to some time ago. But Engaging with the challenges of the digital world, even using phrases like the digital world, can make us sound like a bunch of scared Luddites, hostile to what is an utterly normal part of life for young people. But whilst the overwhelming majority of a young person's online engagement will be entirely positive, something to be encouraged, there are dangers there, just as there are in the real world, and it is our responsibility to address them. Pornographic material is easily accessible, even with any supposed nominal restrictions to viewers over the age of 18 which is in practice impossible for a service provider or website to verify. I should say that negative consequences don't end if the viewer is over the age of 18. The normalization and widespread availability of pornography has contributed to misogynistic social norms that objectify women and create entirely unrealistic expectations about sex and relationships. There's plenty of research showing the negative impact on the well-being of young people, of young women in particular. And there are also distinct dangers around sharing sensitive personal information. As smartphone usage has become more widespread amongst young people, sexting has become a major issue, as mentioned, but one that many parents and teachers are unprepared and unfamiliar uh, with. As Gillian Marston's motion highlights, this has led to an increase in children being reported for sexual offences. The sharing of intimate photos without consent has an obvious impact on well-being. Now, Scotland's introduced new laws to criminalise the sharing of these kinds of images, which is a welcome legal protection. But a debate does need to be had about the approach we take to young people involved in this and whether reporting them for an offence is always the most appropriate approach. And I hope the Minister will touch on that and the very positive work that's been ongoing in that area. But I'd like to look briefly at the cultural rather than legal issues that come up here. Educating children and young people about online safety must address the individual impact, for example, of sharing intimate images. But it's absolutely critical that they also appreciate the wider cultural impact that this has on how sex and relationships are viewed and of how society perceives and values women in particular. This is why I've pushed so hard over the last year for personal and social education in our schools to be reviewed and overhauled. Given that three in four young people across the UK 
did not learn about consent as part of sex and relationship education at school. We have a long way to go before we can say that all of our young people are prepared with the life skills that they need. And with relation, the relationship between issues around consent and online safety being so clear, we can't see education on either topic as existing in a silo. Nor can we see these issues in isolation from mental health education and a range of other health and well-being areas. A holistic, consistent approach to personal and social education is absolutely essential here. And that approach will only happen when young people are the co-designers of that curriculum. This resolves the issues of expecting teachers to address issues which are generationally alien to them, as well as fostering the kind of buy-in and commitment from the young people themselves that we need to see. I look forward to the results of the government's review of personal social education following our committee work. And the minister's closing remarks today, I hope we'll, we'll make some reference to that. This is often an awkward issue for politicians to address, but it's too important to avoid, and we are well past the time for getting to grips to it. I call Marie Todd to respond to the debate. Uh, around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to close to today's debate on this crucial agenda of encouraging cyber resilience among young people. And um, I thank Gillian Martin for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. And I thank all of the members present here tonight for their valuable contributions. As Gillian Martin said, we don't know the half of it. And um, as a parent myself, I'm quite glad of that <laughs> in many ways. Um, but obviously there's a tension, as Liam Kerr mentioned, there are some um, dangers which very young children are exposed to, which we need to protect them from. Um, it is perfectly appropriate that our older children have some privacy and some private life to grow and develop in. But we as adults need to teach them the skills to operate in what is a perfectly normal, normal world. But it's a world which many of us didn't grow up in and um, it's very unfamiliar to us. Um, as a number of people mentioned, um, we don't let our children go swimming without first um, teaching them how to stay safe in the water. So it is very much our responsibility to give them the skills to navigate um, this world. Um, it was great to hear um, Tavish Scott mention particularly the Shetland Island um, children and young people who, um, I, 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 as a representative of the Highlands and Islands, of course, I'm always delighted to hear about young people taking the initiative and taking the lead. And I think indeed that is the solution. Um, they can help to educate us and um, do the job of educating themselves better than uh, we can in many ways. Tavish Scott and Rona Mackay and Finlay Carson also mentioned holding corporates to account, and I think that's a very valid point. Um, I agree um, very much with that, and I'm delighted that um, one of my colleagues, Kevin Stewart, had a recent success with um, Snapchat and taking the primary school location off that um, particular app. I think that's a very um, useful um, progress. Um, Ash Denham mentioned about how pleased she was that she spent her young years without Facebook. I have to say I'm delighted that my young youth and development was spent largely without photographs, never mind <laughs> Facebook. Um, the hideous 1970s haircuts that have survived, <laughs> um, that very little photographed era, um, are, are not a pleasure to look at. And I'm glad that every misdemeanor that I, I engaged in as a teenager, uh, there isn't a record now. And, and Emma mentioned, Emma, Emma Harper mentioned that as well, that there is absolutely a risk of leaving a permanent record um, of what's relatively normal teenage boundary pushing, um, which will not be viewed positively uh, when, when children reach adulthood. Um, Mary Fee and many others talked about the need for conversation. Um, we all do need to talk about these issues and that's definitely the best way to, to help folks stay safe. Like many others in the chamber, I've mentioned I'm, I'm a, a parent and I agree that in many cases, um, and I think you know, this was mentioned by Finlay Carson, Brian Whittle, Dan Daniel Johnson, and many others, actually it's as adults who need to take the lead and demonstrate good behavior online. Um, 
I probably am in the only family where the adults break the rules regularly at the dinner table about going on our devices. Um, and undoubtedly, um, I am not, um, you know, I'm not alone in this chamber of having, in having suffered online abuse um, in politics. And those people hurling that abuse online at me are not children, largely. I would say those people are adults. So we adults need to um, take some responsibility and up our behaviour as well. Um, Ruth Maguire, I absolutely loved the little touch of neuroscience that you threw into your speech. I think that was especially for me to help me feel comfortable in my first ever um, debate, uh, responding to a debate as a minister. So um, yes, absolutely, you're quite right. The teenage brain um, is designed for heightened risk taking and it's very susceptible to peer pressure. What I would say is it seems that the teenagers have an excuse where we adults don't. Um, <laughs> it feels particularly timely for us to be discussing this today on Safer Internet Today. The, th day. the, the theme this year is create, connect and share and respect and a better internet starts with you. And um, it'll help to continue to encourage us to explore better ways in which we can support children and young people to use technology responsibly, respectfully, critically and creatively. What happens to us when we're children absolutely shapes who we are and has a huge impact on us throughout our lives, especially if those experience are ad experiences are adverse ones involving exploitation or abuse. We all have a responsibility to do all that we can to ensure that we protect our children and young people from harm, wherever that harm occurs. We also have a responsibility to equip our children and young people to be informed and prepared to make the most of digital technologies and, and with full knowledge and understanding of the consequences of their actions online. Decisions about what our young children and young people share online and with whom have really serious um, ramifications for their future. <laughs> In 2016, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice commissioned research to analyse recorded crime statistics which showed other sexual offences had become the largest category of sexual offences. 40% of recorded sexual crime is made up of other sexual crimes, the largest individual category just ahead of sexual assault. The research report uh, recorded crime in Scotland, other sexual crimes 2013 to 14 and 2016 to 17 published in September last year highlighted that half of the offences falling within the other sexual crimes category are communicating indecently, causing to view sexual activity or image often committed online and most likely relating to the sharing of intimate images. These online crimes are much more likely to have younger victims, mainly female, and younger perpetrators, mainly male. As a result, we've established the expert group on preventing sexual offending involving children and young people to look at and identify further steps to prevent sexual offending by young people. The group will bring together expertise from across justice, education and health to consider how we prevent and respond to sexual crime committed by young people not least by considering how to protect our young people by educating them about their rights and responsibilities under criminal law. Now, I see my time is running short, so I will mention that in September last year, we made commitments in the programme for government to address the modern challenges of enabling children and young people to enjoy all of the unparalleled opportunities provided for by increased technologies, while doing so in, an, in a safe way. We committed to continue building on the good progress we've made towards implementing key measures in the National Action Plan on internet safety for children and young people. In closing, I want to thank the members for their very thoughtful reflections throughout the debate. My ministerial colleagues and I are absolutely determined that Scotland's children and young people are afforded protection from harm wherever that harm is caused. We're taking action across government to continue to raise awareness among children and young people on how to stay safe online and the consequences of their actions, to provide support to professionals, parents and carers, and to drive forward progress in understanding how to prevent offending behaviour. And what better year to drive this progress forward than in the 2018 Year of Young People? And I'll finish with very wise words that were given to me this morning by a young girl at Holyrood School. Um, and, you know, when I was asking the kids what they wanted me to say in this debate, she came up with a very wise saying, which I think we could all take this advice in this chamber. She said, I realised that all of my best memories were not online, so I take a day off each week. Thank you. 
That concludes the debate and I close the meeting. <laughs>